Good morning. Did everyone enjoy that extra hour last night? Yeah. Hopefully nobody showed up an hour early. Uh, if everyone wants to pick a spot, pick a chair, stand in front of it, as Ben says, we'll begin. <clears throat> encouraging start to our service together to sing the gospel that we are here to worship because God is good and we are not right we are not arbiters of good that we won't know the count the, the cost of our sins on the cross but that God is good and that he came to earth in his and he gave his, his poverty right to us like it's pretty encouraging Thanks for leading us in that. Um, we have a few announcements to that end, some logistical stuff here to communicate. Um, there's a Thanksgiving service uh, at one of our kind of sister churches. Um, it looks like it's going to be on Thanksgiving morning at 10. 
Um, so uh, you're welcome to, you're invited to that. It's in, the address is in the bulletin, but it's on about 114th and Stark in Southeast Portland. And so if you um, have some time in your schedule on Thanksgiving and you wanna make time to do that, um, you'd be welcome. Um, there's an offering uh, that they're gonna take during the Thanksgiving service and they're gonna um, give that to hurricane relief. Um, so, and then, um, Saturday, December 22nd, we will be having a Christmas program. Um, uh, excuse me, Sunday on the 22nd, there will be a Christmas program. We'll have breakfast. We'll tell you what time that is coming up so that you're aware. Um, and then later that evening, we'll have the Christmas program at 6. Um, and then there's uh, a fellowship potluck and sharing time next Sunday. So as you put your mac and cheese uh in the oven, uh, then also think about what has the Lord been doing in your life? How can you glorify him and give thanks to him? Is there a song we should sing or a scripture you've been meditating on? Remember, if you are five or 95, you can share something. So um, feel free to think about what the Lord is doing in your life and what you might share in that sense too. And then the last announcement I have that I'm aware of is the day after Thanksgiving um, on the 29th from 4.30 to 7.30. We are going to have a trivia night, and there will be pizza for everybody who shows up, and childcare for kids fifth grade and younger. There's gonna be a movie shown. We'll figure that out as soon. Um, we will not vote on that, little kids, so don't even think about it. And you should bring friends, a snack or a drink, and we'll have some table games to play after the trivia is over. If you want to sign up, um, you, there's gonna be email sent out, and just RSVP to that. Any other announcements that I'm not aware of? Oh, yes. There's still room at our table today for the soup and salad. Uh, we would love to have you come. Uh, there's a lot of people. There are some people who know the direction and how to get there, and you can tag along behind them or ride with them. Um, yeah, we'd love to have you come. Okay. We're a half hour away from church. <laughs> Before we uh, sing the next few songs, I found a few verses that get quoted throughout them. So I'm just going to read those few verses. <clears throat> Psalm 65, verse 8. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And then a couple from Revelation. Uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And chapter 5, verse 12. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You can go ahead and stand if you're able.
The ancient. 
Today's uh, reading will be on Psalm 40, and uh, Matt says I should dismiss the kids, so age, age five and under, I guess. <clears throat> Give it a second. Four and under, okay, four and under, apologize. Psalm 40, if you're, if you're turning to a paper Bible. Okay, to the choir master, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust on, in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and has not turned to the proud nor to those who have become involved in falsehood. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done and the things you, are, you planned for us. None compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burn offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I, like to, I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad to be with you this morning as we share God's word together. I'm uh, grateful for the online uh, 
when I was in Connecticut, I was able to uh, be part of the body because of what Scott and the team does. And so I appreciate it. And I know there will be uh, those who watch what we're doing this morning. We can share God's word together. Let's pray. Father God, we come to your word. We just ask that you might uh, open our hearts to who you are and what you have done in the lives of others, that you might do the same in us. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Our current sermon series is about being citizens of heaven while living here on earth. And if you went to version this morning, or if you just look closely at your bulletin, you saw that my sermon today has two points. Because my assigned topics were obedience and patience. I'll begin with obedience. Obeying. Easy to say, hard to do. As these two cartoons illustrate, the Bible has much to say about obedience. From the beginning chapters of Genesis, where Adam and Eve made the fatal choice to disobey God, Clear to the closing chapters of Revelation where there's a massive rebellion against obeying God following the, hundred, or the thousand year reign of Christ. Obedience has always been humanity's major problem. The obvious opposite of obeying is disobeying. Humanity is very good, or should I say very bad in this area. My top three biblical examples of being disobedient would be Adam, King Saul, and Jonah. You know their stories. In the Garden of Eden, Adam disobeyed God. He ate the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin entered the world. King Saul disobeyed a divine instruction. And that led to a chain of events that ended eventually with his rejection as king of Israel. And you know Jonah's story. He spent time in the belly of the great fish because he was disobedient regarding pre preaching to the Ninevites. If I were gonna go through the Bible and pick out the most disobedience, I would certainly give a hard look at the kings of Israel and a number of the kings of Judah. Disobedience, put those aside. I wanna talk about obedience. And I think there are many examples in scripture people who are good examples of obedience. I thought through this, it's great length actually, and I came up with 10. Here's my list in alphabetical order. <clears throat> Abraham, Ananias, Esther, Joshua, John the Baptist, Mary, Moses, Noah, Paul, and Ruth. And if you think about their stories, you can guess why I chose these people. But of this, these 10, who are the top three? Who would you choose? Who are the most obedient people in scripture? I'm gonna give you my examples in just a moment, but if a sermon's all over and you have someone that you think was a much better example than what I chose, we'll talk about it. Noah. Noah's my number three. He's a remarkable example of unwavering obedience to God's commands. Scripture says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with his God. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. By faith, Noah went on about things not yet seen, and reverent fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. He's a remarkable example of obedience, even when facing what seemed to me to be a nonsensical task. God comes to him and says, build an ark. The ark had probably never been built before. And there certainly didn't seem to be any need for a big boat. But Noah doesn't question. Noah doesn't waver. His faith was unshakable. He trusted God completely, and he goes to work. He gathers the necessary materials, and he labors year after year after year, and he constructs the ark. 
He faithfully uses the precise measurements that God gave him, the specific specifications that God has said. He stays with God's instructions. He doesn't do shortcuts. He doesn't think, well, I've got a better idea than you do, God. I guess that's a good example for us. You know, we need to remember that as you read through the scriptures, God's instructions are not suggestions. When he gives us a command or a, a, a statement, we should follow it because God's given it to us for our well-being. And we should conscientiously and faithfully follow God's word. And his obedience went beyond just building the ark. He followed the instructions about getting his family in the ark and getting the animals in the ark. He ensured their safety and their survival during the flood. Noah teaches us the importance of putting our full confidence in our God, even when we don't have the answers, even when the path ahead seems dotted or uncertain. If we trust God, his goodness will always be the right thing to follow. You know, Noah lived in a world consumed by wickedness. But in that world, he was described as a righteous man. He was blameless among his contemporaries. Three things about Noah. He chose to be obedient. He chose a path of righteousness. He chose to live a life that pleased God. And his story encourages us to do likewise, for us to stand firm in our faith, to follow God's ways, even when our society chooses a radically different path. We are called to live a life set apart and to stay true to the word of God. Noah's my number three. My number two, Moses. The life of Moses as revealed in scripture gives us another great example of obedience. Hebrews 11, 24 and following. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting, fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Noah's story. He's out tending sheep in the land of Midian of all places. When all of a sudden, God appeared to him in a burning bush. God tells Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to go to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh. I want you to demand the release of the Israelites. I want you to lead them out of Egyptian bondage to a place I will show you. We know the story. Moses hesitated. <laughs> I'm inadequate, I can't do this. It's, it's too, something I just not, and on and on he went. But once he committed to, to obeying God's call, he is a great example of obedience. He faithfully took God's commands to Pharaoh, and he faithfully took God's commands to the Israelites. Led not only to the liberation of the Israelites, but it, it set the stage for things that were going to happen later that were great miracles. You remember the story? He leaves Egypt, they're heading toward the promised land and suddenly look in the rear view mirror as it were, and there seemed to be millions of Egyptian soldiers pursuing them. In that perilous situation, Moses listens very carefully to God's instructions and doesn't question them. He disregards the apparent hopelessness of the situation. He simply does what God says. Lift your staff. He does. And the Red Sea miraculously parts. And he allows the Israelites to cross safely. God's, or Moses' trust in God was complete. He was willing to obey even in the most dire circumstances. And his life is filled with other instances of obedience. As he led the Israelites, through 40 years of the wilderness, over and over again, he does what God says. And then, when he received the commandments on Mount Sinai, he faithfully relayed those commandments to the people. He's a great example for us today. His life illustrates that sometimes 
being obedient requires perseverance. Sometimes it requires courage, especially when you're in the midst of opposition or adversity. And Moses' life certainly was not without his challenges. He led those rebellious people for 40 years, but he remained steadfast in his obedience to God. If you reflect on his life, you'll see great lessons about the importance of following God's instructions. Great lessons about trusting God's guidance. Great lessons about remaining obedient when the circumstances are challenging. Moses' obedience serves as a reminder that when we align ourselves with God's will, he can work in and through us. Well, if it's not Noah, and it's not Moses, who would you choose as number one? Well, I'll tell you, Abraham. His unwavering obedience throughout a variety of situations demonstrated his complete trust in the character of God. He was completely convinced that God would fulfill his promises. Hebrews 11, 8 to 10. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham, he exemplifies obedience that when he was called by God, he left behind his familiar homeland and began a lifelong journey of faith. He left Ur and headed westward. He didn't know where God was going to take him. And he trusted God's promise regarding the descendants and the land. But in the years that follow, Abraham didn't see the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Yet that didn't diminish his trust in God's plan or his willingness to be obedient. That alone would put him way up on a list of obedient people. But I put him as number one. And I think his willingness to be obedient to God's test of faith when God commanded him to offer his beloved son Isaac as a sacrifice, that moves him to the top of my list. Abraham, without hesitation, trusted God, believing that God would make all things right. Now, we've read the book. We know at the last moment that God intervened, provided a ram as a substitute sacrifice, which of course foreshadowed God's ultimate sacrifice of his own son for the sins of the world. But Abraham didn't know any of that. He didn't know what God was going to do, yet he was obedient anyway. I think his obedience illustrates that true obedience in God requires total trust and absolute surrender, even in the face of the unknown. Abraham did that. He trusted God and became a model of obedience down through the generations. So, in summary, all of that, be obedient. My other assigned topic was patience. Like patience, like obedience, patience is easy to say, hard to live out. Many of us are like the cat in this cartoon. God, make me more patient. Right now would be nice. Yeah. We want the end result. We don't like that there's a process to get there. Impatience is very common in our culture. We even have a crime category called road rage, where anger and impatience come together and too often with tragic results. Well, the Bible has much to say about patience. Did you know that in the scriptures, patience is identified as an attribute of God? And patience is listed and presented as a virtue that we are to pursue. Well, I have some verses about patience there. If you go to the scriptures, in the Old Testament, you will see patience mentioned occasionally in the books of wisdom, but you will find it frequently mentioned in the epistles. It's a virtue that needs to be developed, 
And as such, you'll find that there are numerous, numerous, numerous exhortations in Scripture about being patient. And for what it's worth, it is interesting to note that patience, those who exhibit patience, are commended by God. I tried to think about people from Scripture who I'd classify as patient. It was much harder to find that list than the list of the obedient ones. So, who would be your top five patient people? I did come up with a list of five. I am going to give it to you in just a minute. But when you think about the virtue of patience, you need to think about it as it has many aspects, many sub parts to that word patient. So I'm going to tell you the, the, my patient person story, and I'm going to identify the aspect of patience I think they best represent. David. He is my number five. You find his story if you read through First and Second Samuel. One aspect of patience as it's revealed in scripture is it's, it's more than simply uh, enduring difficult situations. It also involves holding on to hope and trusting that God will be faithful with you in the midst of those difficult situations. We know David's story. It wasn't an easy one. He was anointed to be king at a young age and then he had to endure years and years and years of hardships and challenges before eventually he was crowned ruler of Judah in Israel. David's noted for his faithfulness in those trying situations. And he's noted for remaining patient when things seem to be falling apart. His most difficult trials came at the hands of his predecessor, King Saul, who relentlessly pursued him seeking to take his life. In those hardship, David persevered and continued to trust in God's timing. He refused to take matters into his own hands. Even when given the opportunity, he didn't take Saul's life. He restrained himself. He trusted that God would fulfill his promises. At long last, after years of patiently trusting God to be faithful, he did assume the throne as king of both Israel and Judah. He's a great example of trustful waiting. My number four is Jeremiah. You'd find his story in the book that bears his name. Trustful waiting is one aspect of patience. Another is long suffering. I looked it up, definition. Long suffering is practicing restraint and tolerance in the face of provocation and wrong, wrongdoing. Prophets in general, we know their stories about their sufferings and the hardships and trials they experience as they try to remain faithful to God's plan. James 5.10 says it well. As an example of patience in, in affliction, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Jeremiah jumped to the top of my list of prophets who suffered long. Remember his story when we were going through Daniel? Jeremiah lived during Judah's history when God was going to judge them. He was sending the Babylonian army led by King Nebuchadnezzar into the land. And Jeremiah was called to be inside the city, in, inside Jerusalem, to proclaim that they were to surrender, that they were to accept God's judgment. Well, of course, the people rejected it. And as a result of that, Jeremiah endured a great deal of persecution and suffering. He was imprisoned, he was beaten, he was rejected by his fellow Israelites. Nevertheless, he remained faithful to God. He continued to prophesy. He faithfully delivered God's message of judgment, even while being rejected and having resistance from his own people. He patiently preached year after year after year, right up to the fall of Jerusalem. If you've read Jeremiah and Lamentations recently, you'll know that Jeremiah's heart was burdened with sorrow as Judah was defeated and Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, we call him the weeping prophet. If you read Lamentations, you'll see why. In the midst of all that, 
he was unwaveringly in his hope of, that God would do what he said he was going to do, that God would uh, judge Israel, judge Judah rather, and would bring them back out of captivity. He reminds, Judah's, Jeremiah's life reminds us that God would have us choose patience in the face of our trials and our troubles, that God would have us choose patience because we know that his plan for us is always good. Number three, Paul. His story is found in the book of Acts, as well as the epistles he wrote. And you remember his story. He was a zealous Pharisee persecuting Christians, and then he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. God gave Paul about 10 years to reflect, to learn, to embrace his new calling before he sent him on his first missionary journey. And it was during those years that God also began to develop patience in this impatient Pharisee. This would be an attribute that Paul would need as he encountered and endured countless trials on his missionary journeys. I see in Paul the epitome of one particular aspect of patience, self-control. As a missionary, he faced intense persecution from the Jews and from the Gentiles. He writes, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet, yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Through it all, he remained steadfast in his faith. He manifested self-control in his actions in all kinds of circumstances, waiting for the Holy Spirit to guide him to the next steps of his ministry, desiring news from struggling churches, dealing with difficult people inside and outside the church, nurturing and guiding new believers. Whatever the situation he was in in his ministry, he demonstrated self-control which is a most important aspect of patience. Paul, realizing that all aspects of patience are important for us as believers to represent Christ well in this world, he stressed patience in almost every single one of his letters. And as we reflect on his personal testimony, as we reflect on his admonitions to us, we've got to agree but Paul's a great example of patience for us. That gives you five, four, three. Who would be number two? Joseph. Latter part of Genesis. And you know his story as well. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. He faced additional trials when he got to Egypt. He was falsely accused and imprisoned. Nevertheless, through it all, he remained steadfast in his faith. He trusted God regardless of the situation. He never gave in to resentment. He never gave in to bitterness. God orchestrated uh, Joseph's right in power. He interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. He developed a plan about the impending famine. He eventually became second in the entire nation. He was at the pinnacle of power in the land. And then at the end of the book of Genesis, we see a marvelous story. His brothers, the ones who sold him into slavery, come into the land. Joseph has them within his power to do whatever he wants to do. When he eventually reveals his true identity, he's not hateful. He's not vengeful. He's good and gracious to them. His story highlights what the importance that God places on forbearance. I like Colossians 3.13, it says it well, because Joseph did this. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. No matter what our trials, we can take inspiration from Joseph's journey as we seek to be Christ-like 
in our actions. Five, four, three, two. Number one, Job. When someone exhibits endurance in all kinds of trials or annoyances or provocations, in our culture we have an idiom. We say, they have the patience of Job. It's true. When the Apostle James was sitting down writing his epistle, he was talk, going to talk to them about enduring hardships as he writes this letter. He wants to pick an example of someone who was patient in the midst of trials. And out of all the Old Testament examples, James picks Job. James 5.11. Indeed, we count as blessed those who have endured. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. Job is my number one. He's a great exemplar of patience. There are a number of reasons that the Apostle James and this James picked Job. First of all, his story stands out because it's in the extreme in the amount of suffering he endured. In one day, he lost all of his children, he lost all of his wealth, he was covered with painful sores, his wife offers him no support, he has friends who come to encourage him, and what do they do? They wrongly accuse him of transgressions and, and blame his troubles on an unrepentant heart. Pain after pain after pain after pain. And yet, through it all, Job patiently endures. Even today, thousands of years later, he's still an inspiration to those of us who face difficulty and struggles and suffering. We are called to follow Job's example to patiently endure, to submit to the Lord, to remember that our God is full of compassion and mercy. Well, there are my top five. As you look at those five people, they remind me, and I would hope they remind you of two things. One, patient is multifaceted. There are a lot of subtleties in the word patience. It can mean trustful waiting, it can mean long suffering, it can mean self-control, it can mean forbearance or endurance. All of those are aspects of patience. So, what's number two? Being patient is a choice. Being patient is a choice. These men chose to be patient and God commended them for it. So I want to close with a, in uh, this, these two verses here, one about obedience, one about patience. When it comes to obedience, I would encourage you to just do what Jesus said. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And from the book of James, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Could we pray together? Father, making right choices is hard. And you've asked us to be obedient. That's a choice. And you've asked us to be patient. And that's a choice. And we get in hard situations. And often we look for the easy way out. Help us, Father, in those difficult, trying situations to be obedient to you and to bring, be patient to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time for our communion and it's a time where we honor Jesus, he who was willing to go to the cross for us. He who is willing to die that we might gain entrance into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> come and they will sing with us. If you're a, a believer, you're invited to come and take of the bread and the cup and worship him.
Let's all go. You're dismissed. <laughs>